It's a busy week for space station traffic with the crewed Axiom-3 launch and the cargo Tianzhou-7, and to make it even better, SpaceX achieved their 300th successful launch. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 19th of January, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Impulse Space has announced a new orbital tug, and it's big. The company's new tug, called Helios, is considered a tug, but frankly, it could really be counted as an extra upper stage for whatever rocket it flies on. Helios is set to be able to move about five tons of payload directly from low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit, depending on the rocket that it launches on. That's already a lot more than any other tug out there. It also rivals Blue Origin's proposed Blue Ring orbital tug that's supposed to be able to take up three tons. This orbital tug could essentially serve as a third stage for rockets like Falcon 9 or Vulcan, and it doesn't need the full performance of these rockets to enable them to push out certain payloads. According to Impulse, Helios uses liquid oxygen and liquid methane propellants, and its main engine, called Deneb, runs on a staged combustion cycle and produces about 67 kilonewtons of thrust. This means that, in order to fly, the ground systems for its rocket's launch pad need to accommodate fueling for it on the pad, as these propellants are cryogenic and would otherwise boil off if they were to be loaded in weeks ahead of launch, like with other tugs. The big size of the tug would also mean that it would likely take up a significant amount of space inside of smaller payload fairings like Falcon 9's fairing. So it's probably not the best for a big spacecraft, but it could be helpful to push smaller spacecraft into faraway orbits, further than Falcon 9 alone could push them. Impulse says Helios is launcher agnostic, so that means that, in theory, this could also fly on Starship. And I'm pretty sure you all know by now that its payload bay is a lot larger than Falcon 9's fairing, so there's a lot more potential to fly some big payloads in there. It'll definitely be interesting to see what potential uses may come about in the future for Helios, but for now, we'll just have to wait until 2026 when Impulse hopes to fly it for the first time. And now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. Starting off the week, we had a Falcon 9 launch on January 14th at 8.59 UTC from Vandenberg. The mission carried 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1061, was flying for its 18th time, becoming the second booster to fly this many times. It successfully returned to Earth, landing on the deck of SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. Another Falcon 9 launch took place on January 15th at 1.52 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket was carrying 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage, B-1073, was flying for a 12th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. With this launch going off without a hitch, this mission became SpaceX's 300th successful launch overall, with two Falcon 1 launches, 289 Falcon 9 launches, and nine Falcon Heavy launches. This mission also featured the shortest time between landings, supported by a drone ship, and also the fastest that an East Coast drone ship has arrived at the booster landing location. Feats like these will be crucial for SpaceX to be able to meet its goal of 144 launches in 2024. In fact, in order to meet that goal, SpaceX is taking a short break from this launch pad in Florida, Slick 40, to be able to perform maintenance and upgrade work for the year ahead. East Coast fairing recovery vessels and drone ships are also undergoing maintenance to take advantage of this short break, too. From the other side of the world, a Chongzhong 7 launch took place on January 17th at 1427 UTC from Launch Complex 2 at the Wenchang Space Launch Center in China. Atop the rocket was the Tianzhou 7 cargo spacecraft headed to the Tiangong Space Station. For this mission, the Tianzhou 7 spacecraft was carrying 5.6 metric tons of supplies and science to the orbiting outpost, as well as 700 kilograms of propellant for the station's propulsion systems. Tianzhou successfully docked to the aft docking port of the Tianhe module on the same day at 1746 UTC, completing the trip to the station in 3 hours and 19 minutes. Prior to that docking, the Tianzhou 6 spacecraft had undocked from it on January 12th at 8.02 UTC to make way for this one. Tianzhou 7 will remain in orbit for approximately 6 to 7 months until the next Tianzhou mission launches later this year. This week we also had the launch of SpaceX's first crewed flight of the year with the Axiom 3 mission. Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon Freedom lifted off on January 18th at 2149 UTC from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. 
The four crew members on board for this mission were Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, who was flying into space for a sixth time on this mission, Pilot Walter Villaday, who was flying into space for a second time on this mission, and Mission Specialists Alper Gezaravja and Marcus Want, who were both flying into space for their first time. This mission featured the third flight of Freedom after having previously supported Crew 4 and also the prior Axiom mission, Axiom 2. The first stage, B-1080, was flying for a fifth time, and this was also the first time that the same Falcon 9 booster and Crew Dragon capsule flew together on two different missions. Both of these had also supported the Axiom 2 mission. This was also the first time that someone flew on Crew Dragon for a second time, as this was Michael's second flight to orbit on board Dragon. As SpaceX's William Gerstenmeyer put it, you could say that this mission also flew a reused commander, too. I think you're demonstrating the ultimate in reuse. A reused commander, a reused dragon, and a reused falcon. Or maybe flight experience is a better word. This was also the first flight of an all-European crew, as all of the members of the crew were born in European countries, Michael having been born in Spain, Walter in Italy, Alper in Turkey, and Marcus in Sweden. Alper Gezaravja also became Turkey's first astronaut, and Marcus Want became the first astronaut to fly from the European Space Agency's 2022 astronaut group. His flight was arranged as part of a partnership between Sweden's Space Agency, the European Space Agency, and Axiom Space. With Freedom now in orbit, the spacecraft is currently on track to dock to the ISS on January 20th at 10.15 UTC. If all goes well, and if the weather cooperates, the mission should come to an end in about 10 days with a splashdown of the capsule off the coast of Florida. You may remember from last week's episode that Astrobotics' Peregrine Lander suffered an issue shortly after separation. Well, since then, there have been a number of important events, as well as some good news and some bad news. The good news is that the Astrobotic teams were able to control Peregrine the whole time. In fact, the leak that occurred on the propellant system eventually slowed down to almost nothing, so they were able to have full control. However, the leak had modified the lander's orbit significantly, and we mentioned last week that one of those possibilities was that it might crash into the moon. Well, the bad news is that it did crash, but not into the moon, rather Earth. In essence, the leak altered the lander's perigree so much that it was well below the Earth's surface. According to Astrobotic, letting Peregrine just continue along that trajectory and letting it burn up in the atmosphere was better than risking it becoming space junk in cislunar space. Nonetheless, the company was able to successfully fire the main engines on Peregrine for short bursts, which helped to tweak the orbit and therefore the re-entry path of the lander in order to not hit any populated areas. Astrobotic later confirmed that it lost telemetry from Peregrine on January 18th at 2050 UTC as it approached the Earth's atmosphere. It's expected that some of the lander's remains might have reached the Pacific Ocean about 10 to 15 minutes after that. For more details on this mission story, stay tuned for an upcoming video from Adrian, who will talk about it much more in depth. Hopefully with the data learned from Peregrine, Astrobotic's next lunar mission can go much smoother than this one. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. SpaceX started to offer Starlink community gateways commercially this week. These community gateways utilize the same gateway hardware that SpaceX already uses for its regular Starlink gateways, but these are for commercial distribution. These would allow customers to get fiber-like speeds of up to 10 gigabits per second and a latency of less than 100 milliseconds. The company has already started proving out this commercial capability at a community on Unalaska Island, where, according to SpaceX, the installed hardware is capable of providing 10 gigabits per second of uplink and downlink with 99% uptime. It's definitely interesting to see SpaceX always finding new ways to offer Starlink's capabilities through different methods. This week, China claimed that it has entered the prototype phase for the main components of the country's lunar program. The claim was made during coverage of the launch of the Tianzhou 7 spacecraft, with state media showing the news of this new phase of development. This would mean that the rocket, the lunar lander, and the deep space spacecraft are supposedly now in the prototyping phase. However, no pictures or hardware were shown, so it is difficult to know just how far into this prototyping phase they currently are. During the same coverage, it was reported that a test flight of the rocket being used for the country's first lunar flight, the Changzheng 10, will take place in its single core mode sometime in the 2025 to 2026 timeframe. This version, which will be called Changzheng 10A, would be able to put China's next generation crewed spacecraft into orbit, while the triple core version, set to debut in 2028, would be capable of sending it all the way to the moon. 
And now let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Later today, we'll have another Falcon 9 launch from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg, California, carrying another 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1063, will be flying for a 16th time and will land on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. Next week, we'll finally have the third flight of the Li Jian 1 rocket from China. The three-hour launch window opens on January 23rd at 3 o'clock UTC. Virgin Galactic will also fly next week with its Spaceship 2 VSS Unity space plane and another commercial passenger flight. The flight is currently planned to take off from Spaceport America on January 26th in the morning local time. A pair of Starlink flights may also take place next week, one from each coast of the United States, but their launch dates are currently unspecified. The next Vandenberg Starlink should occur around the 25th or 26th, while the other launch could happen as early as the 26th from Launch Complex 39A. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight!